A little while ago, we released a video around the seven foundational landing page best practices. If you're interested in those, you can check out this video right here. In the wake of that video, as well as from some other channels, we heard about a number of other strategies that you had heard from people were best practices but weren't included on the list. So today, we want to address that. To be honest, most of those things aren't best practices. They're probably something that's worked out really well for a person over the course of their career or works really well in a certain industry but might not work well in others. Now, all that said, that doesn't mean that those strategies can't be useful and aren't worthy of a test in pretty much any campaign to see how they might work. So in this video, we're going to talk about new strategies that you could test on your landing pages, but we're going to stop short of calling them best practices. Just like in our landing page best practice video, I have seven different strategies to go through in this video. These are all individual ones that we've heard from people in the wake of that video or that we've heard lots of people repeat regularly, so we wanted to dispel them. This is by no means a comprehensive list, so if there are any other strategies you would like to hear about in this format and you want us to put together another video, we would love to hear about it in the comments below. But as you can see on the screen, the first strategy we're gonna talk about is removing the site navigation from your landing pages. Throughout this video, I'm gonna use the Paid Media Pros website. This is not a set of landing pages, but I also just didn't wanna steal some third-party brand site and likeness and put it on here, so it's easier to use our own and I'd ask you to use your imagination that let's say it's a landing page. With that said, the home page of Paid Media Pros has a site navigation on it. What people are saying when they tell you to not have site navigation or to remove the navigation on your website effectively means to not have these different options available so that people can't find other portions of your website and they're only able to interact with the page that they're on and not find additional pages on your website. This does have some benefits because you can limit users straying from converting on the page. The goal of all landing pages is to get people to convert. That's the ultimate thing we're trying to do with our paid media campaigns. So by removing the navigation, you take away all different paths that they could take on your website. The problem with that is you really only allow for them to convert or bounce. And if they're not ready to convert, they're going to bounce they don't have any chance of further learning about what you do, what you're offering, how you're differentiated from your competitors. They're only given the information that you gave them on that landing page and nothing else. There's nothing else for them to go on. If you're advertising to people who already know about you, have been to your site before, or are in a very common industry where most solutions and offers are pretty similar and people don't really need to do lots of further learning, this might make sense for you. But if you have a product or a service that people need to have lots of education and want to be informed of before they take the plunge, this might not be the best move limiting them so much that they basically just leave because they're not ready to convert just yet. Since this is the first tactic, hopefully you can see how each of these is going to lean into me telling you that you should run a test on this. Clearly there are some benefits of removing the navigation on your landing page, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna work for everybody. So if you're curious about it, run a test and see what performs best. The next strategy I hear people talk about is referring to the language on the landing page and how you're portraying your service or your product to your customers. And oftentimes I hear people say to use benefits, not features. So as an example of this, and I'll admit this is a crude example, let's say you're trying to sell electric or hybrid cars. One benefit to that is that you have to stop at the gas station less because you don't need as much gas because the car is hybrid or electric. So this is how you would say it potentially as a benefit statement. People are benefiting by not stopping at the gas station. If you were gonna focus on a feature, you would say that you have a 500 mile battery range. You would lean into the specifics about why the battery keeps you away from the gas station. So this is the difference between a feature and a benefit. By using benefits, you tie the conversion action to the user's emotional state. There's not really an emotional connection to saying a 500 mile range battery, but there could be an emotional state tied to stopping at the gas station less if it's always a pain for that person to stop at the gas station and they really hate it. You're tying it into the irritation of needing to stop, to get gas, to pay money every time. So by saying that they stop at the gas station less, that can be really useful, leaning into those benefits. But the problem is not everybody is going to be an emotional buyer or not every buy that they make will be emotional. If you only ever lean into those benefits, you're not necessarily giving the specifics about how people are going to get those benefits. Features tend to be a lot more specific than the benefits and they help people understand how they are going to get those benefits, especially for products where somebody might not understand how things work. 
This is particularly true for people developing software because not every user is going to understand how that software is going to save them time, but every software touts that they can save you time. So by using that benefit, you're not actually differentiating yourself and you're not highlighting the strengths that you have. So in some areas, it might make sense to get more technical and focus on the features in addition to the benefits, if not instead of the benefits. The next strategy is to minimize form fields. If you're trying to generate leads, we hear very often that you should minimize the number of form fields that you're using and keep it as short as possible. Again, using the Paid Media Pros website as a less than perfect stand-in, we have a form on our site that's offering you to book us to speak. We ask for name, email, company name, and request type as required fields. And then there's a message field that you can fill in depending on what you want the request type to be. If a conversion rate specialist was going to come talk to us, they might tell us that we really only need the name and the email, and we don't have to have the company name or the request type for somebody to fill out the form. And that does have its benefits, but we keep those additional fields on there for specific reasons. If we were going to limit the number of form fields, we would reduce the friction on the conversion. It's easier for somebody to fill out a form that only has two form fields than it is for them to fill out one that has four or five or more than that. So if you're going for the maximum number of conversions, minimizing the form fields could be a very good strategy for you to use. The problem with that is the less friction that you have on that conversion action means more people are going to fill out the forms and that has a higher chance for lower quality leads. If someone's not very serious about getting in contact with you, they're probably more than willing to send just their name or just their email to you but only the serious people are going to be the ones who take the time to fill out a 10 field form and make sure that they get you all the information they need for you to give them a quote or get back in touch or whatever it is. So minimizing form fields can mean that you have lower quality leads and the more leads that you have means more work. Again, if you're going for maximizing the number of leads you have and you have plenty of time to work them, that's great. But if you have a limited sales team and you're like a lot of companies in the United States right now, it's hard to hire people to follow up on those leads. So it might make sense for you to not have as many leads as possible coming in and only focus on the leads that have higher quality. The next strategy we hear a lot is using only one call to action on every landing page. And I'll admit, this is one that I leaned into for quite a while and that I told my clients to utilize only one call to action for every page, but I've absolutely softened on that over the past few years. And we'll cover that here when we're going through it. Let's again use the Paid Media Pros homepage as an example. On this page, there are already a few different calls to action available. You can subscribe or follow in the very top bar. In the main navigation, you can click on See Us Speak and you can book us to speak directly from that page. Or you can watch videos in the lower half of the page where you can see the latest Google Ads video, latest Facebook Ads video, so on and so forth. So we've got effectively three different calls to action. Social media engagement, book us to speak, or watch a video on the site. Now imagine your landing pages. Do they have these different types of calls to action throughout the page, or are you focused on just one thing? Do you have a free trial and a demo button next to each other? Or do you have something that only says purchase and that's it, and you don't have any other options? Now let's talk about why that strategy might matter. Using one call to action absolutely helps focus your user on only that desired call to action. If the only metric you are held to with your paid media campaigns is that conversion action, it likely makes sense for you to focus only on that piece. Depending on the business that you're in or the clients that you work with at an agency, you might be asked to only increase the number of demo requests or newsletter signups or pre-order purchases of something. If there's no interest or desire of generating any other touch points, using one call to action is probably the best move because that's the only thing that matters and that's the only thing you're being measured on. But if I'm honest, that feels like a really old school approach to anything online anymore that doesn't provide the user with any option to convert on any other action. Not everybody is gonna be ready to take the exact same step when they come to that landing page. They've likely all gotten there in a number of different ways at different times, potentially through different channels and different targeting types. So although you're limiting it and focusing on your one action, you're not actually catering to what your customers might need to have the information that they would like to have before converting. In the world of post GDPR and post iOS 14.5, this also limits your ability to gather first party data. Depending on how effectively your cookies are tracking people, it's going to be hard to retarget to those users who came to this page and bounced because they didn't have any other path forward other than this one call to action. By providing a softer secondary call to action, 
you are at least allowing them to learn a bit more about your company, engage a bit more, and also gather some information for your own first party data set that you can use across all different channels moving forward. So depending on what your KPIs are and how much you're trying to nurture users through the buyer funnel, it might make sense to use one call to action, but it might make sense to develop a few others and sprinkle them throughout the page as well. The next strategy is a little different take from the types that we've talked about already, but it's about creating landing pages for every single keyword. So people who follow this strategy would have some different landing pages that look sort of like this example. The keyword would be small business software and the headline on the corresponding landing page would be small business software. Perfect match. A user who follows the strategy would then also potentially have SMB software solutions as a keyword, and they would have a second landing page with a headline that said SMB software solutions. Again, a perfect match. Just like everything else, the strategy does have its benefits. Your keywords and headlines will match up pretty perfectly, as perfectly as you make them, so the user will likely feel like they are in exactly the right place and you are offering them exactly what they looked for. This is a good, strong tie to your landing page. But there are also lots of problems with this. Depending on how many keywords you have, you will have a ton of landing pages. And that might not sound like a big deal because once you've built them, they're there, right? But what if you decide you wanna change the format of your landing page? Now, instead of doing it for one, two, three landing pages, you have to do it for all 50 or however many landing pages you've built to correspond to every single one of your keywords. This is a major pain in the butt and it is really hard to roll out system-wide changes if you make even a single tweak on the landing page because you have so many different iterations of them. Additionally, there are solutions that'll help you do this dynamically if you wanna do it. So rather than creating individual landing pages like some people will tell you, you don't actually have to do that if you really wanna stick with it. You can use software that'll dynamically change the headline to match the keyword that you want it to match. But we've all done keyword research and we all know what our keywords look like in our accounts. Keywords do not fit in with perfect grammar every time and they don't always perfectly reflect your offer. So having your keyword be the headline on the landing page and it be slightly disjointed from the rest of the page likely isn't the best foot forward for you. If you insist on having the headline match every single keyword that you have coming from your paid media campaigns, I absolutely suggest you do it dynamically. But more often than not, I'm leaning more into the strategy of if it's close enough, and most of these terms make the most sense, write the absolute best landing page that you can for your company, putting you in the best light and giving your customers everything they need to convert. And then if the headline doesn't match perfectly, that's okay because the landing page itself is gonna make up for it. Next, I wanna talk about optimizing your landing page for SEO. I have no examples of this because I'm not an SEO professional and I don't necessarily know what all goes into optimizing a page for SEO. But as a paid media person who has been told that I should utilize only pages that have been optimized for SEO, I can tell you that this isn't always my favorite strategy. As a benefit to this, it does allow your landing pages to rank highly in the search engine if they are findable. If you allow the Google or Microsoft or any search engine to crawl your landing pages and offer them in the search results, optimizing them for SEO absolutely can get you in front of more people. But the problem is search engines are not your customers. You might be getting in front of the right people because you've optimized for SEO, but depending on what the different performance indicators are for that, you might be optimizing away from the specific conversion actions simply to make your page rank higher in the organic listings. Obviously there's nothing wrong with having your pages rank highly for organic listings, but rather than try and make one page lean into both strategies, organic and paid, I would suggest that you make a set of pages that are optimized for organic and really lean into that and then create a second set of pages that are optimized for paid media and lean into that. And then just don't let the search engines crawl those pages. That will also prevent you from having big swings in performance on your paid media campaigns simply because the organic algorithm has changed. It does that quite often. And if you're trying to chase those metrics, you are going to be making impacts on your paid media campaigns just by following those organic metrics. The last strategy I wanna talk about is when people tell you to always keep your landing pages short. Rather than give you any sort of example, I think that you guys know what short and long landing pages mean. And if you simply do a Google search for this, you will find all sorts of blog posts that will support whatever your opinion is on it. You can find some that support long pages, some that support short pages, some that tell you that you should use both. Whatever you want, you will be able to find a blog post that talks about it in the search results. But in my experience, 
short landing pages can help limit overwhelm for your users. You're giving them only one specific thing to do, very short amount of information that helps focus them on the call to action because there isn't other information for them to start reading about, other pages for them to go to, all sorts of things. But again, the problem here is you might not be providing them with all of the information they need to convert and you're limiting your ability to show off. Having a short landing page might make sense if people are already familiar with you or if the call to action itself is relatively light, maybe just downloading an ebook. But long landing pages can be really helpful if you need to convey exactly why somebody should work with you as opposed to somebody else, what the features and benefits of your different product or service are, and it effectively operates as a salesperson that the user can interact with at their own pace. While short landing pages can keep you focused on the call to action because it's probably always in view or only shortly out of view, the easy way to overcome that on long landing pages is to just add calls to action throughout the page. If you have an entire section about benefits, put a call to action at the bottom of it before you go into your user reviews. There's lots of different ways that you can overcome any objection somebody has to why a landing page should always be short or always be long. As I mentioned after that first strategy, every single one of these has its merits. I'm not saying that removing your site navigation or only using one call to action is a bad strategy. I'm saying it's not a best practice. It's not something that you should categorically opt into without testing. Every site, industry, individual business is going to be different. So if any one of these specific strategies is something that you've always heard as a best practice and you've always followed it, maybe go give it a test. See if your assumptions or everybody else's assumptions actually hold up when you start to collect user data. Some of them might stick around. You might always want to use short pages, but you might be surprised how well a long page does, or you might find that there are different user benefits to having a long page in your arsenal and not only short pages. If nothing else, I hope this video helps you dispel these seven individual strategies as best practices because they're not, but rather they're things that you can test in your individual accounts to see if they work for you. If there are additional strategies that we didn't use in this video that you'd like to hear about and whether we think they're best practices or just something to test, we'd absolutely love to hear about it in the comments below. Thanks for watching our video. If you thought it was useful, give us a thumbs up below. We release a new video at least once a week. So if you want to get notified of when a new one comes out, be sure to subscribe to the Paid Media Pros channel.